The flat white has like a very thin layer of foam where a latte has about an inch. I actually don't like a lot of foam. It's already looking so good. Oh, that's really good. Really? That's really tasty. You may right. have changed my coffee life right now. <laughs> So I had this idea to open a coffee shop while I was working full time in finance. It just started becoming too much. People were telling me, it's time to decide. What are you going to focus on? As the team has grown and we've gotten better at prioritizing and cutting out a lot of the noise, we've been able to, as a team, think about what the long-term plans are for the business. Prioritization is challenging. <laughs> Every successful entrepreneur I've ever met, they began with passion. I've never heard a small business owner say that they got into it because they love spreadsheets or they love project plans or resolving team issues. Those are the things that tend to take up most of our time. And I want to understand what are the decisions they make and the systems they put in place that allow them to still stay focused on what truly matters. So I'm in Los Angeles to meet with the founder of a fast-growing chain of Australian-inspired coffee shops called Bluestone Lane. Nick Stone started the business while he was still working as an investment banker in New York City. So I figured he'd know a few things about how to prioritize his time. What do you think came first? You wanting to be an entrepreneur and then coming up with an idea, or coming up with an idea and then wanting to be an entrepreneur? I think coming up with, it, with the idea and then wanting to be an entrepreneur. I just had this real desire to, to do it. I just thought people would love it. Bluestone Lane may be known for its fantastic coffee and food, but that wasn't why Nick started the business. He wanted a place that reminded him of the coffee shops he loved back home, a warm and welcoming place where all customers are treated as locals. The first store was around the corner from the office where I worked. Wow. And when you opened up that store, did you leave your job? No. You're yeah. a full-time banker, yeah. and you've got this going on the side. Yeah. yeah. How are you deciding what to focus your time on? Well, early on, I wasn't going to have a natural role in the store. Now, I, I was about finding the real estate, determining the menu, determining the pricing, determining how we were going to the brand, the name, what the values of the company were. Even that can be a full-time yeah. job, right? Well, it's about prioritization. I had to commit and determine, well, on the weekends, I'm probably going to work at Bluestone and during the week I'm going to have my banking job, but I'm going to visit Bluestone twice a day. It was a passion project. How do you decide that something is not a priority? Well, one of the things I introduced at Bluestone was this decision-making framework. The three lenses I focus on it. It needs to be good for the local, good for the brand, economically rational. Mm. And that has been the guiding principle for all of our team, to make decisions faster, to have that autonomy and act on it in the right way. For us, it was ultimately always going back to why do our locals come to Bluestone? It's not just about getting a coffee, it's about feeling special and feeling like you're part of our community and that you've got a daily ritual where you can come in and we know you and you know us and that's a pretty magic thing. Nick spent three years dividing his time between his banking job and his new business until he finally decided to take the leap and go full time at Bluestone Lane. Seven years later, they have over 65 locations across the United States. But entrepreneurs don't always have the luxury of time to learn where to focus their priorities. So I traveled to Durham, North Carolina to meet Tiffany Griffin and Daryl Heron, the founders of Bright Black, a candle company that celebrates black culture and history through scent and storytelling. Let's start with hip hop because it's one of our most popular scents. Yeah. And hip hop is actually how Bright Black was born, was our shared love of hip hop. Oh wow. And so we're like, well, why not use candles to shine a light on the beauty that is this genre that we both love. You guys like hip hop. Some people would say, all right, let's like 
go to a concert. <laughs> <laughs> let's make a candle instead. Right, let's, well, I'm very crafty, and and she is as well. And I think we we stumbled upon yeah just this love for candles, and we wanted to to try making it ourselves. Huh. It wasn't until years later, 2019, yeah, that we actually were you know that Tiffany turned it into a business plan. Yeah. Bright Black began as a passion project and found a fast growing community of customers. But in 2020, nothing could have prepared Tiffany and Dariel for the press they were about to receive. Beyonce comes up with this black curated yeah. list of black businesses to like pay attention to and to support, and we're on the list. It is a shock to a business, yeah. particularly a small business that's pouring 12 candles at a time in their basement <laughs> with a toddler. We didn't have the systems in place to manage demand. We were like literally sleeping probably two hours a night, oh, yeah. maybe. It was a little stressful, but it's a great problem to have, and it's been a great problem to have. After experiencing overnight success, Tiffany and Dariel became inundated with logistics, so they had to figure out ways to stay creative and ensure that the quality of their products didn't suffer. One of my board members gave me a piece of advice when I was starting my, my company, which was like, what do you love to do, right? Figure out what that is and also what you're good at, mm -hmm. right? And make sure that that's something that you should continue to own and really spend time with, mm -hmm. right? It's constantly spreading out across everything as opposed to really focusing. Yeah. Do you find that happening to you? Absolutely. The decision to come up with a new product, undergirding that are like countless hours of micro decisions. So we're ready to kind of pivot in a way where Darielle and I are not holding so much of the knowledge and the labor <laughs> ourselves. Yeah, and then how does that happen? We decided to come up with priorities for the year. Wow. Hiring was number one, so we said that is the priority for the year. We have to build the team. We have to offload from the two of our plates. Sometimes you need time to tinker, to get it wrong, and then realize why you got it wrong, and then have these beautiful epiphanies. All of that takes time and energy, and you can't do it when you're, like, spending six hours doing something in Photoshop that a graphic designer can do in 10 minutes, you know? So how are you making that time right now? So I've carved out some time for Tiffany Tuesdays. Every Tuesday, I drop my daughter off at school. I go back home. I meditate. I work. I think that rebounding time is so underrated. And that restoration, I feel, like is integral to the business. Trying to decide what really matters and realizing, like, if I'm using my time to do X, I'm not going to be doing Y. Going back to why did I start Bright Black? It sounds kind of cliche, like what is your why, but it really, really helps. If it's not driving that forward, then it's probably not that important. Three years after Bright Black exploded onto the scene, Tiffany has learned that hiring the right people and carving out specific time for creativity, even just one day a week, helps her stay focused on the company's core mission. But remaining close to the heart and soul of your business can be tricky when you're building a global brand, which is why I wanted to head back to see Chip and Jake, the founders of the successful cookware brand, Made In. Last time, we talked about how they got their start. This time, our conversation turned to how they were managing their rapid growth. And I even got to see their pans in action in their very own test kitchen. I have to say, I've been to a lot of offices. I've never been to a place where there are literally programmers and designers on computers out there, and then we're in a kitchen right here, all in the same building. This is why we built an office, uh, so we could design a kitchen that we could use for product testing, for bringing chefs in to do pop-up dinners, instructional videos, and just like really getting the product in our hands. This is really like the inspiration center. Um, you've bought our products, they're in your kitchen, and now we're developing recipes for you. We're teaching you famous chef's recipes to use in those pans. So how did you guys decide that creating this type of content and sharing these types of recipes would actually be a priority? The worst thing we can do as a brand is sell somebody a product, they receive the product, and then put it in a cabinet and never use it. Our thing was like, how do we create the content that as soon as the pan arrives, they're 
like, motivated and engaged. And, like, I'm going to go try that tonight. Get the first use out of the way, fall in love with the product, and then come back and buy more from us. The thing that mattered to us most was that these pans create an amazing steak. Like, it has to function. It has to perform. You guys are, I think, pretty clear on what it is that you love to do. Like, yeah. But then the question is, like, how do you then eliminate all the other things that are vying for your time? I mean, we got a really good piece of feedback from our uh, investors really early on that asked us that exact question. What are you doing on a daily basis that is not something that you enjoy or is not something you're good at? And go hire for those positions. Because the reason why we invested in you is to do what you are good at and what you do love to do. Like, that is what makes this brand special. So that, that frees you guys up to go into the world. So Jake, go make chef relationships with the best chefs in the world. Chip, go build a digital scaling platform. Yeah. And you know, they were instrumental in like reframing how we thought about building an organization and then building a team. I mean, the first six months we ran, we didn't hire a single customer service person because we wanted that direct connection. We learned what content we needed to create to help them out throughout the journey. So we ended up driving a lot of the decisions we made. It's really important for us to be on that ground level for that from day one. Well, I think one of the coolest things about starting a business, as much as there are things you're not good at and don't want to do in perpetuity, the ultimate benefit is to be able to get to try everything, right? Like, you can't go work for somebody else and be like, I know nothing about this. <laughs> I want to run it. Like, and, and learn everything from the ground up. Yeah. So, like, the invaluable stuff is being able to learn every part of the job so you can absorb what you like, what you don't like, what you need to learn more of, yeah. um, and go from there. Oh, it looks great. What about you, Jake? What's one thing that you want to keep doing no matter what? Obviously, product is the main part of my job. And I think a little bit more nuanced is, like, how we show up to our chef community, like the chefs we partner with, how we take care of them. You know, you have to surround yourself with team members that compliment you. There are things on the product side I'm really good at, and there are things that I definitely need support on. Chip's laughing, and he can probably talk to you about that. No, but I mean, then it's surrounding yourself with the people that can bring that kind of support. Yeah. And the same goes for kind of every different team that we build around ourselves. Do you find it useful in each day to have some slack that is completely unscheduled. Chip's better at that than I am. You have your mornings blocked yeah. off. I create a lot of fake meetings on my calendar. <laughs> Jake's cut mistake. Is that Hey, you did it. Look at that. Jake. <laughs> Good. He's ready for any mistake. Hey. She's going to try and steal it. <laughs> Little alligators. Yeah, seriously. As Maiden has grown from a direct consumer cookware startup into a major brand, Chip and Jake's roles have grown as well. But they've developed techniques to handle their demanding schedules and stay focused on work that excites them. Which is something that Nick Stone does as well. He's also striving to maintain a vision while scaling a rapidly growing business. Your priority is human experience. How do you ensure that that's the priority of the people you bring on? I think it comes very much down to who you're hiring, how you're hiring, how you induct and how you train. Well, I think a lot of the time it's a natural orientation towards making people feel happy and solving a need or an issue. And that's what I look for. I don't look for technical competency because I had none in hospitality. Hmm. I couldn't flip an egg, let alone make a coffee. You know, when you started, you had a very specific way that you wanted Bluestone to feel. Yeah. You wanted it to feel local. But what ends up happening when you start to expand to all these different locations? Do you find that you're not able to create that local feel anymore? Well, that, that ultimately is the greatest challenge. Because I think that having the uniformity of the coffee or food is far easier than executing the level of service you're looking for. What we've found is it comes down to ensuring that the leadership at the store level is really, really bought in to our commitment to having local stock customers. The staff composition, the teammate composition in each location is different, and it should feed off the energy in that local environment. Being really fortunate that as we've grown, generally, we've got it pretty right. I think the hardest thing for me to understand when I was CEO of a startup was the difference between something being a good idea and it being a priority. We are constantly provided ideas and pats on the back and compliments that we could extend into this vertical or this geography or we can rebrand and extend. But if it detracts from your core proposition, is it really worth it? And as you're trying to scale with more people, more stores, more regions, different time zones, more complicated and longer and 
and unusual supply chains, it takes more discipline to say no than yes. When we talk about priorities, what we're really talking about is time. Like, where is your time being spent? As an entrepreneur, you're hiring people to do a lot of the other stuff. But the one thing that everybody's counting on you to do is to think about where things are headed. Making sure everybody's aligned in what's most important and what we're going to go after and what we're going to not go after. And then from there, just trusting people to execute on what they're great at. I can't be everyone's role. I have to execute my role. And having clarity around that makes everyone's jobs easier. There's still so much to do, so much to build. As hard as it's been, things just like twist and turn in ways that keep validating us, inspiring us, and motivating us. The way that entrepreneurs tend to find that time is through systems. Finding ways to do more with less, but those things aren't always obvious. Talking to entrepreneurs, what I realize is that you almost have to keep part of you sort of in tune with like, what are the things that I'm doing all the time? And how do I start to over time make those things a little bit simpler?